So, yes, as Pedro was saying, in this session, we are going to, to discuss two very common patterns that uh, you will certainly need to use when, when designing your Apache BIM pipelines, branching and merging peak collections. Um, we will see that in each of the patterns can be implemented in a variety of ways, uh, depending on our use case. So let's get started with the options that we have uh, when branching peak collections first. So the first, uh, the first option we have uh, is the one that you see on the screen. You can use the same P collection as input for multiple transforms uh, without consuming the input or altering it. In the example, for instance, we are, reading, we are reading a collection of names from a database and we are using two Pardot transforms to filter the same P collection and uh, keeping the names starting with A in one case and the names starting with B in the other. There's uh, another way to, to branch a pipeline and that is to use uh, like the, to have a single transform output to multiple P collections by using tact outputs. The transforms, uh, Transforms that produce more than one output, pro, uh, more than one output, process each uh, element of the input once and write to zero or more output P collections. If we try to compare this pipeline and the previous one, you can see that they perform the same operation in different ways. The second approach uh, performs better if the transforms computation per element is uh, very time consuming. Okay, so so choose that one in 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 that case. And uh, then there is a final way to to branch uh, P collections that uh, that is to use the the partition transform. That is another another one of the Apache Bean core transforms. This transform, what it does, it, uh, it splits an input P collection into multiple smaller output P collection, and it does it uh, according to a partitioning function. The number of, of partitions must be determined when the graph is constructed, okay? So you can, for example, pass the, the number of partitions as a command line uh, option uh, at runtime, uh, and then it will be used to build your, your pipeline graph or you can, but the, the thing is that you cannot really determine the number of partitions in the middle of pipeline of the pipeline based on some data calculation that, uh, that you might be doing in the pipeline, okay? So let's see in a diagram, let's see in a diagram how the, the partition transform works, okay? So uh, you see there that we have a, an input collection. Uh, the elements are colored shapes, and we want to, to split it in, in three P collections, uh, each of them containing the shapes of a specific type, okay? So the partitioning function, what it's going to do is going to check the, the shape type, and it's going to return a, a number identifying the output P collection that the element belongs to, so zero for squares, one for circles or two for triangles, okay? If we move to a more practical example, we have, um, we have read a P collection of, of names from a database and we want to split them alphabetically. That's really a perfect use case to use the, the partition transform. Using a partition in function that uh, takes the first character of the name and based on its value, it returns the partition number that the element belongs to. So for instance, zero for A, one for B, etc. So let's now, uh, I mean, we have uh, Inigo here and he's going to, to run uh, a few examples demonstrating all this in a code lab, okay? So exactly. Thanks a lot, Miren. Uh, let's now head to Google Colab. You should see the link to the call up in, in the chat uh, in case that you want to follow along with me. I will try to go slower than yesterday, but I don't promise anything. I will do my best, that's for sure. So the first thing you need to do is to install Apache Beam running this cell. I have already done it so you don't have to wait. And that's you're going to import everything that you're going to need um, for the session. 
So in case that you run into any error running this, this particular cell, you will need to restart the running time. So you can go to runtime here, let me make it bigger. You can go to runtime and restart right time. So with that out of the way, let's start with the actual code. The first example we have here is the first example that Miriam explained. We can use the same pit collection as an input to perform different pit transform. In this, in this case, we have um, this set of elements that are dictionaries. Imagine that th those are a table. We have a column called names, another column named sports. And we're going to create those using the create transform. The create transform is a very easy way to create big collection without needing to use file system or accessing a database. And it's very practical for, for these examples. So we are assigning to this big collection that we're creating the variable, uh, the big collection variable elements picol. And just by referencing those two, we can perform different uh, different P transforms. In this case, we have names that what it's going to do is perform a map function with uh, a lambda, and it's going to retrieve the name column. And we have the same for sports that it's going to retrieve the sports column. Let's run the cell. The same as Israel, I'm using Interactive Runner because we get this beautiful graph that you see here. And it's very useful for, for this scenario. So we have the create, our pcollection variable, and now we have this branching of the, of the pipeline. We can see that we get two results. The first one names with the names column and the name, the, the, the sports uh, pcollection with the sports column. Okay, that was easy. Let's continue with partition. That was another example that made and sell. We need partition and because sometimes we want some specific element to go to a place and not go to the other. And with the previous example, this, this possibility is not covered. So partition, what it does, it takes a, an element, applies a, a function to it, and depending the output of this, this function, it will send it to one place or the other. The output of this function should be the index to, the, uh, to which the element will so, so go to. I have an example here using partition, the idea is that we're going to split elements by even or odd. And we are going to create the elements using brains. So we're creating elements from zero to nine. And now we're going to perform the partition. I'm using a lambda function that has two variables and a partition. The first variable here is going to be the elements, what we're going to do to the elements. A partition should be the number of partitions that we have. In this case, since we're going to split by even and odd, we're using the modulo function, and depending on the index, we will send it to one or the other. So for example, if we take number five, number five modulo two is one, and it will go to the index one, which is odd. If we take number eight, eight modulo two is zero, so it will go to index zero even. And in this side, we just have the number of partitions that we needed. In this case, since it was even a node, we have two. So let's put a two, two over there. Let's run the cell and confirm that this works. And here we go. We get the even numbers and the odd numbers. Just so you get the hang of it, let's modify this to retrieve. Instead of even a node, we're going to retrieve multiples of three, multiples of three plus one, and multiples of three plus two. So I'm going to change this to zeros zeros, ones, and twos. We're going to create the same elements. This lambda remains the same, but we need to change the modulo to three because we are calculating things in modulo three. And since we have three partitions, we do a three instead of a two. Let's now take our population variables here that we're going to print using ib.show. And this is running, and we get the multiples of three, multiples of three plus one, and multiples of three plus two. Okay, let's see a very common use case for partition. Let's say that we have a data set and we want to split our data set uh, in test and train just to perform some machine learning operations to it. In this case, what I'm doing is creating 100 elements and I'm going to just split them using partition. So I have set a percentage that I want to split the test and train data for. And the function that we are applying to the elements is just generating a random number 
and comparing it to the percentage. In case that this is uh, lower, this will be true. And when we calculate the integer of a Boolean being true, it returns one. So it will go to train. In case that we uh, the random generator returns a 0 0.99, this will be bigger than percentage. So the Boolean will be false and the integer will be zero. It will go to train. Let's run the cell and we see how well our split is. So we got 92 elements for train and eight elements for, for test. Of course, the split is not perfect because we're using a random generator. If we increase this to 10,000, uh, this will be better. Let's wait for it. It will take a, maybe a little bit more. And we get, we're not so not such a good split as well. Mathematics, right? Sometimes it works and sometimes it, it doesn't. Actually, it always works, but okay. <laughs> so this partition function doesn't cover all the possibilities yet. What happens if we want to one particular element to go to more than one place? This is what Israel was showing you in the previous session. Um, with the error, error handling, you can tag our uh, the outputs with a pardon. So this code here is a little bit hard to understand. I will do my best, but in case that my explanation is not the best and you want to try it, Later, I have everything written here. So let's go through the code together once. I'm creating eight numbers, and the idea, oh, and then I'm doing a, a pardu. The idea of the pardu that we have the class here is that we're going to uh, output to three branches. We have multiples of x, multiples of y, and the main output. Notice that we, in the process, we have three three parameters. We have self, of course, and we have element, which is the element that we are sending to the Pardu, but it's coming from the previous B transform. We have X and Y. And the way we're specifying this X and Y is just adding quarks to our Pardu. So we're doing X equal two and Y equal three. So we're checking multiples of two and multiples of three. In order to check that, we do again the modulo function, checking if it's a multiple of X. And in case that this is true, we yield this to a tag output. We use p-value dot tag output and we send the element here. How do we send it? So the first part of the um, parenthesis has to be the name of the tag. In this case, I'm naming it X. And the second part is the actual element that we are outputting. In this case, I'm just outputting element, but in case that I wanted to output half the element, I could do it like this. And now the element that we're actually outputting is half the original element that was introduced to this part. But let's leave it like that. We want to get the actual multiples. We do the same to y. If it's a multiple of y, we output to, to this particular tag name y. And it doesn't matter what, we, are, we have a main output with all the elements. Now that we have our pardu, we need to tell the p transform pardu which outputs we're using. So we have x and y, which we will say without outputs and the name of the tags that we're using. So if we run this, we will get a p collection tuple variable called diff outputs, and in, in case that we want to retrieve the P collection for our particular branch, we can do it in different ways. One of the ways is just using the P collection tuple variable and doing dot the name of the tag, which is going to be X and Y. And we can also do it as if it was a dictionary and do X. For Y, do we do exactly the same? And for the main output, we do just none. So diff outputs, brackets, None. Let's run the cell and let's hope I didn't make any mistake here. We get the three branches, the multiples of X, let's go back here, multiples of X, multiples of Y, and all the outputs. So we get multiples of X, which are the uh, even numbers, the multiples of three, and all the outputs. Notice that six, that is a multiple of two, multiple of three, it's also in the main output. So we get an, an element that went to more than one place. And the same with zero, for example, it went to all the all the branches. Again, if this explanation wasn't so clear to you, I hope it was, you have the code here, uh, the explanation here, so you can go through it later and check it out. Um, this was my part for for the splitting of the, um, the big collection. Let's see if you have some questions that I can address or Miriam can address. Yeah, we have a question in the Slack. Um, oh. Is there a, sorry, Miriam. Go ahead. No, you, you. please. Uh, is, is there any way to dynamically create tag outputs while the job is running? Or do you need to 
um, know ahead of time when the job is submitted to Dataflow. Um, as far as I know, I'm, I'm 90% sure, uh, give me a 10% margin, uh, you need to know it beforehand. I think it's exactly the same as partition. Uh, you need to, to know how the, the graph is going to be determined beforehand. Uh, but if you need to determine the things on runtime, maybe what you can do is instead of outputting the element itself, create a, a key and then use another part do or another a combine or something. Combine will be addressed on on the next uh, session. Maybe you can perform an operation depending on the key that you have there and you can define the keys dynamically. But I'm again, 90, I'm going to go to up to 99% sure that you cannot uh, split things uh, dynamically. Okay. And Miriam, maybe maybe you you know better than me in this. Oh, I think it. Uh, I think uh, you are right that uh, you cannot really work it out at runtime yet. So I mean, he seems pleased with your answer. So. <laughs> uh, okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, any any more questions, guys? Before we move to the merging and the merging P collections uh, part. Okay, so I get is back to you, Milen. Yeah, okay, cool. So, yeah, let's look now to, into the merging P collection use cases. So, what the, one of the ways that we can do that is to use another of the core uh, core transforms of the of Apache Bean, that that's the flatten transform. What does flatten do? Um, it just merges multiple input P collections with elements of the same data type in a single P collection, okay? So looking at, uh, at it in this, uh, in this diagram, we have three P collections of shapes and the flatten transform simply merges the elements in the P collections to create a, another P collection um, containing all of them uh, as output, okay? So going to a more practical, more practical example, okay? So this example, it's actually a continuation of the first example that we saw at the beginning of, of the session today, when we had uh, we had done some branching uh, of, a, of an input P collection into two P collections, one with the names starting with A and another one with the names starting with B. So what we could do here is introduce a, a, a flattened transform. Uh, so we created a, a, a P collection that included both uh, the, the the strings with A and the strings with uh, starting with B, okay? Very simple. What's the, the next way of merging uh, two P collections? Another another core transform of, of Apache Bean, the co-group by key transform, okay? So what does this transform do? This transform performs a relational join between two P collections, okay? The, the collections must be key. So the elements have to be key value pairs. And uh, the key uh, of uh, the collections that are in the input have to be of the same type, okay? So going to, to, the, to the diagram, um, we see it uh, quite clearly there, right? So we have two P collections that are key like, I mean, the elements are, are uh, color shapes and the key of the element is going to be the color of the shape. So green, orange, yellow, and, and the value is going to be the type of shape, okay? A square, circle, triangle. So we do the co-group by key transform. And what we are going to do is like to join both the P collections by the color of the elements, okay? Into a single one. And uh, the key of the elements uh, is going to be in the output. It's going to be also the color. And uh, the value of the elements is going to be um, a list of the shapes that have the, 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 that particular color, OK? So uh, like with a more, with a, with a more tangible uh, example, um, we have a, like uh, in the figure, the pipeline that is reading, uh, for instance, uh, imagine that we have a shop and it's reading the names and the addresses from a database table, okay? And uh, the names and the orders uh, or the order numbers of, 
of the purchases that customers are doing are coming from a Kafka topic. So the, the pipeline, it's going to use a code group by key transform to join uh, both, uh, both collections, okay? Because the key is the same, the key is the name, okay? And the resulting P collection is going to have, uh, is going to be keyed by name and it's going to contain like per key the, the order, um, the orders and the addresses, okay? Belonging to, to that customer. And then the final, the final scenario that we have for you is to use uh, side inputs, okay? To merge, uh, to, to do the merge. What is a side input? A side input is some, some kind of additional input that uh, a do function can access. It's time it's going to process uh, an element, okay? Uh, and the, the, the element that we have in the, in the collection, that collection is called the main input, okay? So we have the side input on one side and the main input. Um, when you specify a side input, uh, what you actually are, go, are doing is to create a view of some other data determined uh, at runtime, okay? So such values might be determined by, by the pipeline input data or they can depend on, on a different uh, branch of, of your pipeline that uh, resulted in a P collection, okay? So you can take that P collection in that other branch and create a view and that is the, the actual side input. You are going to see this very clearly in, in, the, following, in the following example, okay? So we have this uh, scenario here. Um, we have a website that is, imagine, selling construction materials for builders, things like concrete, bricks, etc. And whenever a builder makes a, a purchase, uh, an event is, is published in, in a Kafka topic, okay? So our customer base, I mean, let's imagine that it's quite small, that we have less than, than a thousand builders uh, that are using our services, okay? So therefore, we can perfectly read our customer profiles from the database table into a peak collection and keep them in memory, okay? That is going to be our side input, okay? And in case that we need to generate, for instance, the invoices for the purchases that our customers are making, we can pass the side input um, uh, with the customer profiles to a Pardue, a Pardue transform. And for every incoming purchase, the transform is going to be reading the address from the corresponding customer profile and generate the invoice and write it to the output P collection, okay? So the, this, uh, this use case that we are see, uh, seeing, uh, the site input had like a, a global window. We, we, we did not have any, any windowing in the, in the site input. What would have happened if our site input uh, would have been also windowed, okay? So we said that the, um, a side input is some kind of view of some data, okay? And when the data is windowed, uh, the, the view, like the, the, when we have a windowed peak collection, the view represents a, a single entity per window. It can be a value, it can be a list, it can be a dictionary, okay? And how does uh, Bean act in, in that kind of a scenario? Um, Bean projects the main input elements window into the site inputs window set and uses the site input of the resulting window, okay? So if the windows are identical, the projection returns exactly the same window for the site input. But, however, if, the, if they are different, the projection uh, is used to choose the most suitable uh, site input window, okay? Couple of... Uh, a couple more things that you have to take into account. What will happen when the main input element exists in more than one window? As when we use, for instance, a sliding window, a sliding time windows. In that case, the element is processed um, once for each window. Each call is going to project the current window for the main input element and the result, uh, it can result that uh, we can have a different view of the site input each time, okay? 
And then um, finally, what will happen if the site input has uh, multiple tri trigger firings? In that case, then the value from the latest trigger firing is the one that is going to be used. We can see this um, in, a, in a practical example. So let's go back to our, to our shop uh, example and consider um, what will happen during the sales season. During the sales uh, season, we will have discounted prices and the discounts will be larger as weeks go by, okay? So if we want to generate, for instance, a report on the daily sales that we have uh, on the shop, our main input would still be the purchases peak collection that we saw before. But in this case, we would be using, for instance, a, a, a fixed one day uh, window to calculate the, the total money that we are making every day. And the site input is going to be a, a peak collection with the discount rates, okay? But they are going to be window by week because we are, the discount rate is changing every week, okay? So in order to, to calculate, uh, like to make their daily report, um, the discount rate uh, corresponding to a particular day, uh, the report is generated, and is going to be obtained by projecting the purchases uh, window over the discounts, uh, the discounts uh, window, okay? And we are going to get back a single, a single value. That is going to be the discount rate for the week that the purchase belongs to. Okay, so that's the way to proceed uh, to proceed uh, when the site inputs are windowed. So now we have a few more examples uh, from Inigo uh, where he's going to apply all these uh, all these patterns. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Miren. So let's get back to our call app, and the first example we're going to have here is flatten. Uh, the issues of the ones we're going to have. So we're creating two P collections. We have elements one and elements two over here, three um, dictionaries in each, the same table as we have before with names and sports. And we're creating these two P collection variables. We're creating create one and create two, a very original name as I'm font two. So now we're going to flatten those. Um, more or less the idea of flatten is like a union in SQL. So you're putting them together, like adding them up. Um, so what we need to do flatten is on the left side of the pipe, this is what I'm calling pipe, by the way, uh, we need to have a tuple with all the p-collection variables that we're going to flatten. And on the right side, we just need the flatten. So let's run the cell and see how this goes. We again have the beautiful graph coming from Interactive Runner, and we get all the six elements as a single p-collection. We can see that the same three we have here and the other three we have here, they are being put together into one big collection. Okay, this was very simple. Let's go to co-group by key. The idea of co-group by key is very similar to a group by key, but instead of doing uh, a group by key with one big collection, we can do it with multiple uh, big collection. And we will get the combined uh, the combined element of all the, 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 the group by keys. The way I think of a group by key is something very similar to a group by key plus a flatten. That's the way I can I think of a group by key. So let's see the example, and I think you're going to get this uh, more clear. So I'm creating two different data sets. Uh, one is going to be jobs, and the other one is going to be hobbies. The elements in jobs are key values, where the key is going to be a name, John, Rebecca, Alice, Charles, and Ruben. And the value of the key of the key value is going to be the job. And the same way with hobbies, we have names as keys and the hobbies they have as, as values. Now I'm going to create this 2 collection using create once again, very easy and fast. And now I'm going to group that key, those two P collections. The way I do this on the right side of the pipe, just group by key. And on the left side of the pipe, I can have either a tuple we, uh, as we had on, on Flatten, or we can actually have a dictionary. The keys of the dictionary is something that we define that we can say whatever here, here. And the value of every key has to be one P collection variable. So for jobs, I have the P collection jobs creates, and for hobbies, we have the hobbies create. Now, these keys here will appear on the, 
on the output of the Krupa key. Let's run the cell and let's see what the output is and how it looks like. We again have the graph, the two branches being merged together into one. So the, the output is a key value where the key is the same key that we had on the, pre the previous P collection, the names in this case, so John, Rebecca, Alice, Charles, and Ruben. And the value is going to be a dictionary with the keys that we defined on the group by key, jobs and hobbies. And the value of those keys is going to be the key, the group by key result that we will apply to that P collection. So we will get the group by key of jobs create and the group by key of, of hobbies. Let's check the data we have here. John, for example, was a data scientist, an adult engineer, and had hobbies, baseball, and piano. If we go back, we see a list containing data scientist and data engineer, hobby, ho uh, hobbies, baseball, and piano. If we check Rebecca, Rebecca was a full stack engineer, and hobbies, football, acting, and reading. And if we go to Rebecca, we can see those values. Notice one thing here. Ruben had a job, tech writer, but Ruben didn't have any hobby. And I'm sorry, Ruben, um, I thought it was better for you to have a job and, and miss a hobby than the other way around. <laughs> and if we check if we check the output, we can see that job uh, Ruben had a job, but the hobbies was an empty list. Now, this code group by key is very really useful when we want to uh, do a join, like we will do in SQL. And we can actually take the same output we, we got from the code group by key, and with some transformation, we can make it uh, the typical join in SQL. So this is the function that we we have here. I'm referencing Cogrupa key, which was the output we got on here. This is the p-collection variable, uh, exactly this one here. And we are going to do a flat map to it. So since we need to output more than one element per element, we need a flat map or a parallel. So this is the function we have. Name is going to be the key. So we're doing element zero. So it's going to be the name, Alice, Charles, whatever. And the jobs is going to be the value, so element one, and we, we check hobbies. Uh, we check jobs, so we will get the data from here. And for hobbies, we do the same. We check the key hobbies. And now with a double four for jobs and for hobbies, we will get all the possible combinations. And since this is, since join is a list, I can use it directly and I will output everything there. So let's run this and we will get all the combined elements as an inner join. So we get John, that was data scientist and baseball, John, that was data scientist and piano, the other hobby, that engineer, the other job, and baseball and piano. And notice one thing, Ruben doesn't appear here. This is because we are doing an inner join. So when it goes to, to here, Ruben wouldn't appear. Again, sorry, Ruben, it's nothing personal. So now I want to explain the last uh, method that we have on, on this session which is side inputs. The idea of side inputs is that p-collection can also take, uh, pipelines can also take p-collection as parameters using these side inputs. And they can be uh, viewed as dictionaries, as list, as a singleton, and some other ways that you have here in this documentation link. We normally use side inputs instead of group by keys when either our data that we're using in the side input doesn't relate key by key to our main input, or maybe we want to enrich our 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 data. There's another uh, another idea that side input is helpful for. This is when we want to join our data as we will do with co-group by key, but we have a rather big left um, data set and a rather small uh, data set on the right. This is something that it's called broad broadcast join, and I will go uh, through it a, little, a bit a bit later, so you can see and get the hang of it. So first, let's go to a simpler uh, scenario. Um, this is the pipeline that we're going to, to run here. So I'm creating some values that have a currency column and an amount on on there. As you can see, these numbers are very famous if you like mathematics and, as I do. Uh, and then I'm going to create some rates. These rates are going to be our side input. I'm going to use this example of changing currency in pretty much all the examples for side inputs. So uh, just FYI, so you, you, you know this beforehand. So the first thing I'm doing, I'm creating my side inputs using a create, and I'm going to create also my values using another create here. So we have rates and we have our main pipeline, which is going to be exchange. Now I'm going to do a pardo. I'm going to call this function here, change currency. 
And notice again that we have two parameters for this function. We have value and we have ratios. And instead of sending a fixed value as we were doing with the splitting, what I'm doing is sending a p collection. The way I'm doing that is just doing p value as dict. So I'm doing our my, my data as a dictionary and the p collection variable that we had over here. And if we go through change currency, this is uh, nothing super interesting for Beam, but in case that you want to check it, it just goes through through the ratios and multiplies the value depending on the key. Nothing too important for, for the session. Uh, one important thing that I want to say is that when we're doing a stick, the input collection has to be key values. You can see that here we have um, euros and the, the value for, of, of a dictionary here and the same for the other ones. And let's run this thing here. Actually, let me print the, the ratios here so you get how the P collection looks like once this converted to dictionary. Notice that this is going to be executed for every single element since we're doing a flat map. So since we had three elements in our value, we're going to print three times our ratio because ratio is going to be called for every single element as Miriam said before. So this is how our side input looks like. We have a dictionary here with the keys and the values for for every for every uh, currency. And then we get the actual value we, once we have merged everything. Let's now go to the join that is very similar to the group by key and actually going to use the same example as before, the jobs and hobbies example. And I want to explain once again why this is helpful. When we do a group by key, what we're actually doing is we're suffering all the elements and we are sending all the elements key by key to a different workers. And this is something expensive. Suffering is, is, is a very expensive operation. And sometimes we just don't want to do it because it, it will take uh, more time than not suffering. But if you want to join, you have to do it. The other approach is using these side inputs. When we do a side input, we actually need to materialize our side input since it's going to be read by all the workers. But we don't need to shuffle our main data. And Every element that will be execute will reach this side input, but we don't need to shuffle it. So if our left uh, data set is big, we will avoid shuffling the big data set, and we just only need to shuffle and materialize our small uh, data set, which would be great. In this example, I'm going to imagine that jobs is rather big and hobbies is rather small. So we have, again, hobbies, I'm creating them, and I'm going to group by key. Uh, those P collection, I will explain why later. Then I'm creating the jobs, exactly with a create and doing a broadcast joint. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that. Uh, this approach of using side input, uh, it's called broadcast joint in some in some other uh, in some other uh, frameworks, like for example, Spark. So uh, we reference the main output, which is jobs create, and we do a flat map. Flat map is going to be calling this function over here. And again, we have the elements and the side inputs. We send our side input as a dictionary after the grouping by key. The idea of grouping by key is because we want to retrieve all the elements that had the same key here. So we will get John with baseball and piano instead of getting just one of those. So let me once again print the side input so you get it, how it looks like. We get the graph once again, and if I didn't make any mistake, we this is how our side input looks like. We get the key and the result of the group by key, so we get all the, the elements as a list, and we get the actual value. Check again that Ruben, as in the previous previous example, does not appear because we're doing an inner join. I'm going to show you this example once again, but in case instead of doing as a dig. Well, I'm going to do it as a list. So let me move this. And now I don't need to group by key. So I'm removing this. Um, I'm going to change, I need to change this. The idea is that uh, here I was accessing to the side input by key since it was a dictionary. Now we don't need to do that. But I'm going to go through the code once uh, once with you. So we're retrieving the key of the, of the element, which was the name. So element zero, then we're getting the value, which was the job, so element one. And now to access the side input, we just use side input here. And since it was a dictionary, we do get and the name, which was the key that we had before. 
now this wouldn't work, so we need to change it. Let's do hobbies, whoop, hobbies equal uh, x0, which is, sorry, x1, which is the, the hobby for x in ho inside input. And this will go through our list and output the values, but we don't want all the values. We just want the values that share the same name as our element. So if x0, the key of the side inputs, is equal to name. And if we do this, if I didn't make any mistake, it should be exactly the same, but as a, as a list. Notice that now this is not a dictionary, it's a list, because it, we were using as a as list instead of as a dictionary. Of course, this will be worse performance because we will need to check all the elements in every single, all the side inputs uh, in all the elements instead of just checking uh, the key. OK, to finish off, we have the side inputs and windows. And I have a picture here of how this works, pretty much the same as meeting had. So when we have side inputs and windows, we need to project upwards from the main to the side inputs. In this case, we have fixed windows for the main output and uh, of 50 seconds, and the side input is going to have 100. So in this case, A will go to 1, B will go to 1 again. Now we're changing the, the window to 2, and then C will, will go to 2, and D will go to 2. We have this as an example. Again, I'm using the change currency currency example. I'm sorry, I'm not that original. So I'm creating some values. And in this case, the table is going to have an amount and a timestamp column. This timestamp column is going to be used to add metadata to our element. So Beam knows when this element was generated. I think Dresa in the first session was using a similar approach to you with, um, with the test stream examples. And we do the same with rates. We have rates uh, 91 for timestamp 0 and 88 for timestamp 100. We are creating the elements, adding the timestamp window. And in the case of the side inputs, we just care about the rate. We're dropping the timestamp. So we just do x rate. And we are adding a window of 100 seconds. For the change, we do exactly the same. We create the values at the timestamp. But in this case, we output absolutely everything. So we will get the whole dictionary, adding a window of 50 seconds, the same as we had here. And now we are doing a part two to change the currency. So instead of using dictionary or, or list, I'm doing a singleton because I know that per window I have one element. So from 0 to 100, I have 91. And from 100 to 200, I have 88. Let's run the, let's run the cell and let's see the output. So for 10 times some zero, so it was the first window for both, we get 91 as a rate and the converted value. For five, it was the second window for the main output, but the same window for the main, uh, for the side. So the first value, which was 91 and the converted value. Now we change once again, both the side and the main input, uh, the, the main variable, the main window, sorry. <laughs> And now we get the 88 because this was times 100. And if we go back here, we will see that this is 100. Let's play a little bit with this. I'm going to change the window of the main input to 50. Let's run this thing and let's see what happens. Spoiler alert, it's going to fail. But let's think about why. It's telling me that we have uh, empty side input. So let's check our data. We are creating elements on, on of Windows with Windows of 50 seconds. But if we check our rates, we don't have any element between 50 and 100. So when the Beam tries to retrieve the, the element for that window, it's going to say, like, hey, I cannot join it with anything. But what do you want me to do? So I'm going to fail. And it fails. How can we fix this? We have two ways. One of them will be, of course, adding one element here, so doing this and changing, I want to change this. This will make it work because now from 50 to 100, there will be values. But there's another way when we're using singletons. We can say, like, OK, in case that there's nothing, use this default value, default value. I'm going to do one. So in case that that window specifically doesn't have any element, 
just use one. Just run the cell. And here we go. From 10, from 0 to 50, we got 91. From 50 to 100, which was failing before, we get the default value of 1. And just to finish off, um, I'm going to show you a streaming example. Please notice that this requires data flow access uh, because and GCP access because you will need to create a subscription to it. And if you run this cell right here, it's going to fail because first of all, data flow running is not imported and you will need the options to access your own project. So I have already prepared this pipeline. I have it running on my project. So let's go to it. And this is the pipeline. So actually, let me go back and explain the code uh, because I didn't do it. So we're creating, again, our traits, key values, and we're going to make them dictionaries, uh, pretty much the same as we did before. And um, we're going to read from this topic. This topic is the same topic I used yesterday. Uh, for those who weren't, weren't there, um, this is a public topic that publishes messages automatically. You don't need to do it yourself. And it contains uh, many columns. The ones that are important for this is, uh, so these are taxi drives that are happening, I think, in New York. And they have a column called write status, and they can be either en route when the taxi is driving, pick pick up when it's picking up someone, and drop off when it's dropping up someone. So we only care about that one. So we're filtering using drop off. And now we're going to create um, a dictionary out of that with the write ID, something unique for, for the write, and the meter reading. This is the amount of money that you need to pay when you're dropping off. To come the, the, the change currency in this case, it's going to just convert this meter reading from dollars to euros and to Swiss francs. Uh, yeah, let's go through it. And we can see that we're reading from pubs up, doing so and so. And if we go here, we can see that the log we have the right ID. I think this is too small. Maybe like this is better. I think it is. So we get the right ID, the meter reading in dollars, 12.8 the meter reading in euros, and the meter reading in francs. Notice that here, I didn't need to add any window. This is because both um, elements, both the side inputs and the main inputs, fall within the global window. And I think this has been everything. I hope I wasn't so fast like yesterday, and you at least got 90-something percent of, of this. Let's see if you have some questions, and maybe Miriam and I can answer them.